welcome everybody. My, my name is uh, Ed Broadbent. I'm the chair of the Broadbent Institute. And, uh, I want to welcome you to one of the most uh, delightful occasions in the history of the Institute for me, the honoring of this absolutely wonderful human being. It's a terrific occasion. To begin, though, I would like to acknowledge the land that we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, uh, the Onishnabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And it is now home to many diverse nations, uh, the Inuit and many peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississauga of the Credit. Thank you for being here to celebrate the legacy of a truly amazing guy, Harry Leslie Smith. The Broadbent Institute is proud uh, to be, on uh, this occasion, joined by the International Association of Firefighters who are co-hosting this event with us. The Institute and the IAFF worked with Harry and his son John to organize Harry's Stand Up for Progress tour across our country in 2015. He went to cities and, and in much smaller towns and communities with participants young and old. Harry packed them in as he did so on a cold night here in Toronto. Harry's appeal in Canada, in the UK, and throughout the world is quite phenomenal. By the time he died just two months ago, millions of people around the world had reached to read his books or hung on to his insightful, irreverent commentary on Twitter. He was a very unlikely celebrity. He wasn't rich. In fact, he would often joke that his grim early life was pretty much the opposite of what viewers see in Downton Abbey. He wasn't a statesman backed by a powerful political party with access to all the tools of modern electronic persuasion. And unlike some pop stars, he didn't start off famous, only achieving his celebrity when he was in his late 90s. So what was it about Harry's message that struck a chord in so many people? His age was part of it. Many cultures around the world revere their elders. They value the wisdom that only comes with experiencing the ups and downs of a long life. Our culture often does the opposite, ignoring or even denigrating the, the lived experience of our older citizens. I exclude myself from this as being a much younger guy, of course. <laughs> but Harry's voice punched through. It was so clear and strong. A living link with the lessons of an era nearly a century ago that most of us cannot imagine and indeed would prefer not to think too much about. His message to us couldn't be more current, including the most recent news out of Queen's Park today. He reminded, he reminded us that what we take for granted, or have taken for granted, about the modern welfare state, public health care, employment insurance, public education, are actually recent inventions in history. They were fought for and built by ordinary people over recent decades. He reminded us that they could be easily lost unless we maintain our vigilance. In addition to his own keenly held priorities, among them public health care and the treatment of refugees, Harry was a fierce ally for so many progressive causes, such as a struggle against racism, for indigenous rights, and environmental protection. How contemporary can you get? Ultimately, so many loved Harry because he was eloquently, chronically, and passionately optimistic. 
He never gave up. Yes, he warned us that today's world can be on the verge of forgetting the hard-won lessons of his generation. But as he said, and I quote, I know we can win because we've done it before. One of the most memorable personal experiences in my life that I've had occurred just a few years ago in the Stand Up for Progress tour that the Broadband Institute organized for Harry and his trip across the country. That tour included a stop in my hometown of Oshawa. A few hundred people crowded into Oshawa's art gallery to hear him, and amongst them was my uncle Aubrey. At the time, Aubrey was a mere 101. Harry was a spry 92. I was a somewhat spry 78. As I watched my uncle and Harry quietly chat in a corner, comparing their lives' experiences, I reflected on the enormous sacrifices and ultimately triumphs their generation had. It was Harry's generation that fought and achieved to bring the welfare state to Britain. It was my uncle's generation that did the same in bringing the welfare state to Canada. As a young man, my uncle had walked, actually walked in the picket line in the famous 1937 strike in Oshawa. He was the good uncle. Many uncles didn't join the, punk, uh, the picket line, but Uncle Aubrey was there. And they fought for, and they got basic rights for industrial unions in Canada, and they fought for and got the eight-hour the eight workday. And out of the grinding depths of the Great Depression and the wreckage of the Second World War, Harry and Aubrey and millions of young people just like them elected the first Labour government in the UK, of course, in 1945, and a year earlier in Saskatchewan, elected the first social democratic government in North America. They, they demanded then more justice, more security, and more economic uh, opportunity for themselves, for their families, and for their communities. In so doing, they laid the foundations for the modern welfare state. In so doing, they built a better world for all of us. Tonight, it's about remembering Harry, but it's also about recommitting ourselves to the struggle in which he was the happy warrior, literally to his last breath. You're going to hear from some impressive people on stage tonight, people who have dedicated their lives to this struggle. And there are similarly dedicated people I know out here in the audience. There's power in community. We say, thank you, Harry, for bringing us together. May we leave here imbued with new energy. To quote Harry, we know we can win because we've done it before. Thank you very much. Good evening, friends. My name is Matthew Green, and I'm honored to join you here this evening as the executive director for the Hamilton Center for Civic Inclusion. And I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge my dear friends and neighbors from Hamilton who have traveled here from the campaign for adequate welfare and disability in the sending off of our comrade, Harry Leslie Smith. Harry is my hero. And not in the traditional alpha male dominance of a Superman, but rather in the dignified heroics of a Clark Kent, who as a journalist spoke truth to power by telling the stories of his time. He committed his early life as an ardent anti-fascist, a term that has in recent times ironically been used as a derogatory term. Harry spent the rest of his life as a witness to the ongoing atrocities of economic injustice and racial intolerance. He served as a constant reminder to all of us that the horrors of World War II were not to be forgotten and that the victory of the freedom from fascism and world domination was not something to be taken for granted. Harry is my hero. 
and his superpower was not his feats of physical strength, but the strength in his vulnerability and the ability to share the vicissitudes of his life's hardships and the perseverance of his everlasting spirit. Harry's spirit is everlasting and ever-present in his formal written works. Most recently, the grave warning that he presented in Don't Let My Past Be Your Future, where he understood more than most the clear and present danger of the values and narratives that are being virtually dominated by the hard right-wing populism that is driven to divide us by fermenting the seeds of hate. Harry's legacy as a World War II veteran and a soldier married well into the new front lines where online and in the social media world of Twitter, he would be our general. Harry is my hero. And it isn't often in life where you are actually able to meet your heroes. And although reg regrettably I didn't get a chance to meet him in person, I was one of his many 240,000 plus followers on Twitter. And like many online and in my generation, the chance of being introduced to the life and work of Mr. Smith was a very unique privilege of our technological times. Mr. Smith followed me back. It was one of my proudest moments online when this man at 92 would connect with me. He would reach out. He would share his support. He provided his continued online support and I was humbled by his grace and grateful for his daily life lessons online. That he would dole out both to the right wing trolls and progressives alike on Twitter. I'm deeply honored to be here tonight with his son, Jason. I was grateful for receiving the advanced copy of his book. And we had works to do a book club and have Harry visit us in Hamilton. Regrettably, we could not make that happen, not in his lifetime. But the stories and lessons that he left us do live on in the hearts and minds of the readers, the followers, and the many people who are continuing to follow the work of his, and the legacy of his son, Jason. So the spirit of our collective resistance to any resurgence of fascism in any form can and must continue in his honor. Harry's legacy is one that brings us here tonight and it is incumbent on each of us to pick up that torch in any format that it might be be it online or in our communities, let us commit to his call to arms by not waiting for Superman, but committing to the values conversation in our country, and by not being bystanders to bigotry and hate. Let's not let his past become our future. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is uh, Daniel or Dan Raza and I'm the board chair of Canadian Doctors for Medicare. We're a organization of doctors from coast to coast that advocate for the improvement uh, and the defense of our publicly funded healthcare system. You know, I and I think, not all, but many in the room today, we've only known a life uh, cared for by the healthcare system that we now call that we now call Medicare. Not having to worry about massive credit card bills or complicated insurance forms when we need to go to the hospital or see our doctor. It's, it's a system that I was literally born into, not far from here at St. Mary's Hospital in Kitchener-Waterloo. And it's the system that I work in now as a family doctor um, just in the east end of our city. Uh, it's a system where I see newborn babies, uh, full-grown adults, and some very spry and energetic seniors. In preparing for tonight, I actually, I actually went back and I re-watched Harry's speech, the one that he gave in 2014 at the Labour Convention, and I think it was the first thing 
that he, the first public thing that he did that launched him into our collective consciousness. And, you know, for, for folks who might have rewatched that recently or remember the speech from not that long ago, you'll remember how in vivid detail he recounted how in the time of his youth, healthcare was a luxury. Only the most rich could afford it. And when it was being delivered, it was delivered as largely a profit-making enterprise. It was a system that left a neighbor of his to die in agony from cancer without the morphine that she needed to ease her pain. And it's a system that failed his own family. It failed his eldest sister as she was consumed by tuberculosis. But he also recounted how after the Great Depression and the devastation of the Second World War, an election in 1945 changed everything. It was only three years later uh, that the UK got the National Health Service, their universal and public health care system. I'm going to read a short quote from his book, Harry's Last Stand, that, um, that just spoke a little bit to how important that was. The creation of the NHS made us understand that we were, in truth, our brother's keeper, and that taxation benefits everyone through, manta through maintaining not just our roads and sewers, but the health of our, ch health of our children, workers, and elderly. To me, the introduction of free health care was the first brick laid on the road to the social welfare state. And of course, he was right. He was right not just about the NHS uh, in the UK, but about Medicare, uh, Medicare here. As I said, the NHS was founded in 1948. Uh, but in Canada, it wasn't until more than 20 years later that we were able to catch up and usher in our own universal health care system. Harry observed the transformational effect of the NHS in the UK. And in fact, one of the reasons why he was invited to that 2014 Labour Convention was because he was part of a shrinking pool of people who did. Because of that 20-year gap between the creation of the NHS and Medicare, it also means that right here at home, we have many people like Harry with us. And if we listen and if we ask, if we listen to what they're saying, they will tell us the very same things. They are in the room with us today. They are also our nearby parents, grandparents, our aunts and uncles. And we need to listen to them to understand how far that we've come in our own country. Medicare and the principles upon which it is based, it's often described in the same transformational terms of Harry's NHS, as the highest expression of Canadians caring for one another. And when the Harry's of Medicare remind us of how much we have to be proud of, and we have much to be proud of, we also have to worry about what we have to lose. And I think many of us feel that today especially. Harry warned of the degradation of public health care by the dual effects of underfunding services and increased privatization. And in Doug Ford's Ontario, we have good reason to worry about both. But worrying and fighting to maintain what we have, that isn't enough. Across the country, we have a crisis of underfunded community, home, and long-term care beds. These are causing downstream problems of overcrowded hospitals and hallway health care. We are the only high-income country with a universal health care system that does not include a universal drug plan. It is not enough for us as concerned citizens to go on the defensive, to just save the furniture. As Harry reminded us, we have to constantly be vigilant and fight for something better. As Harry fought, we have to fight. We have to fight for an accessible healthcare system that is based on medical need and not ability to pay. We must agitate for a system where, though getting to, into the door is important, getting into the door, it isn't enough. We must demand a high quality, patient-centered, and equitable healthcare system built on the best available evidence from around the world. And I think as much as I and I think all of us here today hope that's, that will happen tomorrow or the day after, I, I don't think we can be that optimistic. Um, it will probably take a, a, a little bit longer and, and there is room for hope. Uh, but until we get there, until we get to that system that we all deserve, 
I think the struggle to get there will pre be a pretty damn good alternative. It will be a struggle that is also the highest expression of caring for our kids, for our parents, for our friends, for our neighbors, and for our loved ones. I think it's a struggle that if Harry were here with us today, he could get behind too. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Andrew Cash, and if this venue was 25 meters across the street, you would be in the riding in which I hope to represent in October of 2019 for the NDP. This is phenomenally talented Laura C. Bates on, as you can see, the violin. It does strike me as I'm listening to uh, the speakers so far, some that have really inspired me to do the work that, that I do, and I've seen people in the audience who have deeply inspired me, that, you know, the bar is set so low these days, right? And one of the many gifts that I think Harry's given us in this moment is to realize and to remember how high the bar needs to be set. And he really surpassed that bar every day. And that was a high bar that at one point seemed like the normal bar. And we need to get back to that place. We need to get back to expecting more from our public servants, from our public representatives, and expecting that we collectively can do more. And I know that's why you're all here, and that's why I'm here. It's an honor to be here to, uh, to memorialize uh, a man who uh, put his family right where mine was, in the middle of Scarborough, Ontario. And uh, John and I were just talking about that, and we realized that we essentially grew up in the same neighborhood. And it kind of makes sense, because my neighborhood was chock-a-block of Irish and British immigrants. and. Uh, I think that might have been one of the reasons why I had this immediate connection to Harry, as well as the fact that he rocked Twitter like no one else. <laughs> now, at the request of the family, um, uh, we're going to play a song that, that, that Harry loved. Now, oftentimes this, this song uh, is sung you know, when people, at, at people's memorials. Uh, but it's also really a song of fidelity, of faithfulness, of, of, of never, ever letting go. And I think that's uh, also an important message at this moment. So we're gonna start there with, we're gonna position this in, in a, a, a place where, in a song that Harry loved. Oh, Danny boy, the pipes, pipes are calling From glen to glen and down the mountainside The summer's gone and all the roses are falling Tis you, tis you must go and I must buy But come ye back when summer's in the meadow Or oh, when the valley is hushed in white with snow And yes, I'll be there in the sunshine or in Danny boy, I love you so.
you come and now all the leaves are dying and I'm dead as well I may be go out and find the place where I am buried and even say they there for me And I will hear Those soft you tread above me Then my grave Will warm and sweeter be For you shall Bend and tell me That you love Sleep in peace until you come to me. Thank you. Just we're just uh We'll just do one more. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I wrote this song, I was thinking about it today, I think I wrote this song 30 years ago. And uh, this is a song about um, climate change and global warming, which you know I sort of picked up on, read about something somewhere, and thought, holy shit, this is serious. Uh, and uh, sadly, we can play the song today, but this really is, a, in a way, a call to, uh, uh, to, to action. You may call me, you may not. You may tell me a thing Now you may hold me And buy me clothes No word, babe This is a game that we all know Now you may have a lot On your mind You may think you're sweet You think you're kind But the strings that you pull Around the world One day gonna tie us up In the biggest knot we ever heard What am I gonna do with these hands? What am I gonna do as I stand? What am I gonna do as the water turns to sand? What am I gonna do with these hands? What am I gonna do as I stand? What am I gonna do as the earth makes the man? Oh, 
What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? Thank you. Thanks very much. Laura C. Bates. Hello. That was just terrific. I really enjoyed that. I'm Elizabeth Ranzetti. I write for the Globe and Mail. I've been enjoying all these pictures of um, Harry and his family and famous people um, and his wife, Frida. It makes me want to have a cigarette, I should say. Too bad it's not 1940 and I could go back and do that. Um, and I will be talking a little bit about um, Harry's relationship with um, uh, celebrities, for lack of a better word, which is interesting because, of course, he was so humble. He came from such humble um, beginnings, and he was himself so humble. Um, I only really got to know Harry a little bit as a journalist, first having seen him when the Broadband Institute did a tour, um, Harry's Last Stand tour across Canada. And I saw him in Vancouver, and there was this really, for lack of a better word, frail old man shuffling out. And I kind of thought, oh, okay, this is very interesting. And he started to talk, and he held this uh, group of hundreds of people, young people, completely captive in his hands for the next hour or so, and probably could have gone on for another three hours. And I realized, like, uh, the good lesson of just how deceptive sometimes our eyes are. And I was fortunate enough to speak with him and interview him several times over the next few years. And he was just a, like a God's gift to journalists because he, was, he spoke as he wrote, as he was. He was very pithy. He was very funny. He was very frank. I could have just run a transcript um, of my conversation with him and taken me out. I was the boring part, and he was the interesting part. And I could have just run... Um, all of his quotes. And I remember the first time I talked to him, he, he told me this great line that his mother had said to him, which stuck with me forever. And I went back and I looked it up. And I cannot do a North of England accent. I apologize. So just imagine it in a North of England accent. But his mother said to him, Lad, there are no happy days for our lot because the Lord mucks have got us in the palm of their hands. One squeeze and we're done for. And I think that's pretty much as true now as it was 85 years ago, probably when Harry's mother said this to him. Um, and I also liked what Andrew said about him on uh, Twitter. He really did rule Twitter. It was amazing. He was like Ariana Grande and Cardi B in nonagenarian form. And you did not come for him because he would drag you. And he had no compunction about that whatsoever. And I always, I was always looking forward so much to his tweets every day because I'd be like, oh, who's he going to fight with today? And who's he going to come out and battle against? And uh, I think this is one of the reasons young people loved him so much. They found him there. He seemed like them. He seemed honest and authentic. And one of the things I thought was so beautiful, when he was dying, um, John was... Um, talking about how many people across the world were reaching out to the family and expressing their love for Harry in this very new platform, which is often, frankly, just a sewer <laughs> of horribleness. And there was this beautiful outpouring for Harry, which I think, and I know that it touched him um, at the end. And he said to John, tell them I love each of them so much. And I'm just going to read some of the things that people said, either in Twitter or um, in letters to John. So Jeremy Corbyn, the um, leader of the British Labour Party, wrote John a letter after Harry died, and it said, in part, Harry lived a long and rich life as a champion of social justice with unwavering passion and commitment for which he was and always will be an inspiration for generations of people. Your father embodied the very best of working class values and socialist principles. He fought for and defended the poor, the vulnerable and the oppressed at home and abroad, 
always with an unrelenting, forceful opposition to the crony capitalism he rightly saw as driving society back to the chronic inequality of his childhood days. And the letter went on. For Harry, socialism was rooted in a genuine compassion and concern for others, both for those that he knew and those on the other side of the world whom he would never meet. It was the appeal to each other's common humanity that gave his voice such power, which so deeply contrasted with the lack of humanity engendered by capitalism and inequality, which he had witnessed over his lifetime. And Jeremy Corbyn's predecessor, uh, Ed Miliband, who was labor leader before Jeremy Corbyn, you saw up there in a picture, tweeted, very sad to hear of the death of Harry Leslie Smith he was one of a kind who never wavered in his fight for equality and justice. We should all carry his passion, optimism, and spirit forward. And there were many other condolences in the UK from politicians actually on both sides of the spectrum, including in the House of Commons from Theresa May. I'm not sure what Harry would have made of that, but you could probably imagine, I think. And in Canada, Justin Trudeau tweeted, Harry's journey and courage have inspired so much love and kindness on this site and in the real world too. Thanks for taking us along. We're pulling for you. And Jagmeet Singh, um, also when Harry was ill in hospital, wrote, the incomparable Harry Leslie Smith is currently hospitalized in Belleville, Ontario. After decades fighting for universal health care, Harry has made a tremendous impact on Canada and on the UK. On behalf of the NDP family, I send Harry Leslie Smith and his family our love and support. Um, I couldn't find any tribute from Andrew Shear. Um, maybe it's out there. <laughs> Everybody wants to email me. We'll add it later. Uh, <laughs> um, and Harry had, of course, he was also, um, he had many celebrity fans, uh, followers around the world. Mia Farrow tweeted, RIP Harry Leslie Smith, a great man. And Billy Bragg wrote, Sorry for the loss, for your loss, John. Your father was an inspiration. As the last of them pass away, we all have to commit ourselves to follow in the footsteps of the generation that fought fascism and founded the welfare state. Rest in peace, Harry. Um, so those are quotes for some quotes from celebrities, but there were also so many quotes, if you go and look on Twitter and other social media platforms, from so many young people too, and they wrote about how they were gutted or they were in fits of tears and things like that, and it found it really moving um, to see that kind of support for him across generations. And I'm just gonna end by uh, quoting one, just an ordinary guy whose name, um, on, who wrote this on Twitter, and his name was Craig Randall, who's a Brit. And he wrote, if anybody should be on the 50 pound note, it should be Harry Leslie Smith. And now we're gonna have a video tribute from Harry's friend, the author, Guardian columnist, and activist and political commentator, Owen Jones. Harry Leslie Smith was an inspiration to so many of us, but not least, younger people, because what, what Harry did with his eloquence, with his humanity, with his empathy, with his compassion, with his solidarity, is give younger people a warning of what would happen if they allowed the rights and freedoms that those before them had won at such cost and such sacrifice be taken away by those at the top. And what would happen if, if we allowed the scapegoating of minorities for all the crimes and injustices caused by the powerful be met without challenge. And that contribution, that, that way he inspired people is a contribution which cannot be measured. It will, his legacy will drive people on to fight with more determination, with more commitment, and with more resilience, and that is as big a gift as anyone can make. Um, we were devastated, all of us, to lose Harry, but we know that what he stood for burns brighter because he lived. And I know from his son how much he was loved personally. I was very, very honoured myself to spend time with him, to interview him, 
to do a talk with him in Oxford where the audience were just uh, you know, completely enthralled by him. Um, and that, he is that, you know, that huge loss on a personal level. And all my love and solidarity to all those who knew him. And I was, again, very blessed to spend time with him when he was alive. But I know that his legacy lives on and we will fight to make sure that what he believed in will win. Um, I'm Jean-Nicolas, I'm with the UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency. And weirdly enough, we are probably the one with the longest connection, in a way, with Harry. Perhaps even longer than with jo John and Harry. Because, as some of you may have seen from a video that we released, because Harry was kind enough to allow us to, to interview him, there's a moment in this video where he remembers when he was a soldier in Europe, looking at hordes of refugees and what it meant for him when he was able to reassure them that they were safe. He describes them as pitiful looking and that when he was able to reassure them that now they were safe, the, the war was over or they were in a territory where they could be getting the protection they needed, he mentioned that there was a ray of hope in their eyes. So our connection with Harry, or rather the connection of Harry with refugees is a long-standing one. It was renewed some 60 or 70 years ago, uh, uh, 70 years after, sorry, when Harry uh, decided uh, to spend his last year to fight the cause for refugees. Uh, he did it very smartly. We have heard Ed and, and Elizabeth just now uh, praising how he was able to uh, amplify uh, the message, how he was able to reach to different generations. He did it very smartly with the refugee, because, with the refugee cause because he was able to speak uh, to millions of people with very simple message, but very genuine message. He went to Europe. There is a picture of him in Calais, actually, on this, uh, um, how do you call that, this uh, series of pictures. <laughs> There's a picture of him with a stand of hashtag welcome refugees. And it's quite incredible to think uh, that he was able to move so many people. When unfortunately he got sick and passed away, we got message from our own colleagues in the field, in the middle of nowhere, in Bangladesh, in Tanzania, who we were so proud to have had a champion like him to take the cause of refugee at a time where xenophobic, racist, and uh, discriminatory uh, rhetorics uh, is really all over the, the media, the political arena, and sometimes in the uh, public opinion in general. I think for us, to have somebody like Harry who could look back at his own experience and bring the past into the current uh, situation was really something extremely important because as he, he said himself, he was one of the last ones standing. And he was able to tell us, be careful. If you turn a blind eyes on the refugees today, you are going to have problems tomorrow. It's not only a question of humanity, it's definitely a question of humanity, of empathy, of ethical responsibility, but it's also something we have learned from history, that you cannot just ignore the most vulnerable, close the door, close the border, erect walls and what, whatever, that you need to embrace the fact that we are a common humanity and that we need to hold our hands to the most vulnerable. I think uh, I want to, before giving the, the floor to Olga, who will speak from the side of, of the refugees and what it means for them as well uh, to have a champion, I want to, to end with just a, a reminder. 70 years uh, after Ari was on the street of Europe, we have never seen that many refugees. We are at a record high level, 25 million. Uh, we have never seen uh, a situation where in a few years, the wind turns very rapidly. 2015, German people were at the railway station welcoming refugees which were coming through, through Turkey and walking up to go to, to Germany. 
Two years later, we are in a completely different situation in Germany politically in terms of acceptance of others. To bring it back here, two years ago, 2016, this country was able to welcome 25,000 Syrian refugees at a very critical moment because at that time I was in Lebanon and I can tell you the first, the, the countries in the first um, line could not uh, uh, shoulder that, that burden. And now two years later, where are we in Canada? What kind of language are we hearing from politicians, from some media, from some public uh, leaders and, and our friends, our, our family. So I think it's important to keep the message of Harry that yes, we can win if we stand up for what is right. Thank you very much, Olga. Hi, everyone. I'm Olga Munyana, though I didn't have a chance to meet Harry Leslie Smith, I had the chance to go through his book, Harry Last uh, Stand, which has a lot of similarities between my story as a, so a refugee myself and his realities back in the Great Depression. Let me tell you a little bit about my story as a refugee. I was born and raised in Burundi my small and beautiful country, but not that beautiful any longer. Back in 2014, I went back from my studies in India, thinking I'm gonna build my country. But that dream, unfortunately, finished being a nightmare because um, I was targeted. Me and some others were volunteers for COSAM, which is a civil society electoral monitoring coalition. We were targeted for publishing the voter registration fraud, which we discovered in late 2014. In 2015, one of the volunteers was killed, and I knew I could be next, so I had to flee. With the help of my family, I got a USA visa. Sorry. Then I flew to Pennsylvania. Back then, I didn't know the uh, difference between Canada and USA, so I came trying to get to Montreal. But I came to Montreal to seek asylum, made it to Saint Bernard de la Calle, which is the border. After almost two days, I was relieved to be able to express myself in French with the French borders, but I was sent back to the United States because of the safe third agreement, which states that only people who have relatives in Canada can seek asylum in Canada. So they sent me back to USA uh, authorities who put me in a county jail. I was shocked that nobody ever even asked me why I was claiming asylum the first time. Sorry. I lived in the United States for over two years. I was not even given a work permit. I lived in as a homeless sometimes hungry. I didn't know how I went from being in danger of death in my own country, forced to leave, came to seek refugee in Canada and sent back, ended up treated as a criminal in a county jail in the United States. In 2017, I came back in Canada, made it to Roxman Road which is a road you, I came and I found myself with thousands of other refugees crossing irregularly to try to make it to Canada. After we went through different interviews with the royal policy, we were placed in one big hall near the border where we were sleeping on the floor. 
after almost a week, were sent to Montreal at the stadium, uh, Olympic Stadium. We were over 5,000 living at the stadium. I remember people from Montreal were prote prote protesting against us. They were so angry we were living at their stadium, as if it, there were a choice between having a safe entertainment place or giving a roof to other human beings. You could tell there were no enough place to accommodate all of us, and it was understandable. Then I came down to Toronto, where I found myself with even worse housing issues, especially for refugees. Though I was able to get a work permit for two years, despite the fact that I'm clearly a refugee in the meaning of Refugee Convention, I'm not able to apply for refugee status in Canada because I was refused under the Safe Third Country Agreement back in 2015, and unfortunately, that refusal still follows me. I know Harry did a lot to try to ensure that refugees can find safety. He first toured post-war refugee camp in Europe after World War II. You could see it in a picture where he says, refugee welcome. When our own agreement turned against us and refused to protect us, <sighs> Harry did really fight for the causes of refugees. Canada is doing a lot. But also, as my story shows, this agreement with the United States puts a lot of people in danger. It put me in danger and landed me in jail for 51 days. I'm grateful to call Canada home now but I don't want anyone else to go through what I went through. I'm grateful to Harry and for everybody who's standing for the right of refugees, like Jean-Nicolas, who spoke for the United um, HCR. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. I'm Andrea Horvath, leader of Ontario's official opposition, New Democrats. And I want to say that I'm honored to be here tonight with all of you to remember and to celebrate Harry Leslie Smith. You know, we've heard from many folks tonight who have shared their heartfelt memories, the experiences that they shared with Harry, the ways uh, that Harry touched their lives. And we all know that Harry was insightful and often irreverent. We know he was courageous, with a heart of gold that was forged through a long life of experiences that many of us cannot even imagine. In his own words, Harry was, quote, one of the last few remaining voices from a generation of men and women who built a better society for our children and our grandchildren out of the horrors of the Second World War and the hunger of the Great Depression. As progressives, Harry has been a beacon for guidance on how to do that again, for assurance that this rising tide of right-wing politics can be pushed back, and for the promise that the things his great generation built, including Medicare, cannot just be protected, but as Dr. Raza said, be expanded and improved for the next generation. You know, I, I know that folks were, were watching the news today and it's been mentioned a couple of times, but that fight is upon us in a very big, big and real way right uh, right now with the um, information that we received about the provincial government's intention to bring mass privatization to our health care system and so although we will still apparently uh, have public health care as the minister of health claimed today what she refused to um, protect is public delivery of service so the public will pay for health care, uh, and the health care will likely be provided by private corporate interests. 
So it's fitting that we're here tonight to talk about Harry and his legacy because we are really in the fight to save and to protect our public health care dollars and to ensure that every single one of our public health care dollars uh, goes to public health care and not to private profits. I also, oh, thank you, you know, I also want to mention that uh, it hasn't been, I think, picked up very much today because uh, of the uh, news on the health care file. But the Financial Accountability Officer for, for Ontario uh, issued a report today. And uh, it, it actually reflects one of the quotes that's been showing on the screen where, t where Harry talks about the fact that, um, that we are definitely headed in a situation where those um, with the most wealth are going to continue to amass more wealth uh, while the rest of us uh, continue to suffer. And I say that because the, uh, the report shows very clearly that in the last 20 years, th when looking at three different income levels, high income, middle income, and low income, that high income earners have done very well and have increased their wealth. Middle income earners have not, and in fact, middle income earners uh, have seen great um, uh, likelihood of falling into lower income earner status, and lower income earners have actually seen a reduction in the amount of income uh, that they, they earn. This is the opposite of Harry's vision. This is the opposite of the values that Harry fought for. And in the last 20 years, we've seen things go in the wrong direction. And that was with the Liberal government in Ontario. This is an Ontario report. I'm very, very worried about what the next four years are going to bring. And we've seen, of course, already some of the decisions that the government's made that will make those uh, observations that the Financial Accountability Officer reported on today even worse. Cancellation of the $15 minimum wage, reduction in increases to ODSP and Ontario Works. I mean, these are things that are going to make things worse for people, not better. Cancellation of the basic uh, income pilot project. So we have a lot of work to do to live up to Harry's passion and to live up to his vision. So as we stand together teetering on what Harry called the sharp end of history, I think we feel his loss even deeper on a day like today. But looking out in the room tonight, I, I know that we have less reason to despair. We have not as much reason to despair as, as I think some of us would think. Because in his writing, in his work relationships, Harry's example shines on. The life that he lived is a blueprint for how to tackle these troubles and build a better future. The lessons that he left us and the inspiration that he left within us is exactly, exactly what we need to keep going and to fight back against the erosion of our social democratic uh, values. Harry knew that we are capable of doing so much better for our communities, for our province, and for our world. He believed that we can build what he called a, a green and pleasant land, one with more prosperity for working people, more security for families, and more opportunity for everyone who needs it. He showed us how we can start building a province and a nation and a world where we don't keep increasing the gap between the rich and the rest of us or even just stop that gap from getting wider but actually start to close that gap that is the job that we have ahead. That's the job that Harry wants us to do. He spent his life modeling the kind of courage that we are going to need to take on the big challenges. Things like addressing climate change, and I was really glad to hear Andrew sing that song that he sang that he wrote 30 years ago when he first discovered the issue of climate change and what that meant for our future. He spent his, mo his life modeling the kind of courage we're going to need to combat the many forms of toxic hatred that still scar our communities and our world. And perhaps most of all, 
Harry showed us the unparalleled value of speaking up and showing up. And I think it's great that we all showed up tonight to honor Harry's memory. He showed us that we don't just resist, that we never stop organizing and pushing for the things that we are fighting for. Harry was clear on this. As he said in Harry's last stand, none of us can afford to be like the citizens of Pompeii and look away from the smoking volcano. Instead, he insisted his legacy is, quote, a reminder that all of us have a part to play in making the world a better place. His legacy, in fact, is all of us. And the best way that we can honor him is by taking the torch that he has handed us and continuing his work. Nowhere in his determination, and in this determination, rather, to continue Harry's work is clearer than that of his son. You know, I was telling John when I arrived tonight, I was uh, reading the, my local newspaper, The Hamilton Spectator, about a week ago, and I read a letter to the editor, and as I'm reading it, I'm thinking to myself, wow, this is amazing, this is the Harry Leslie Smith, you know, to a T. Um, and so I told my staff I was going to be giving remarks tonight, and I said, you've got to go back to The Spectator and find that, that letter to the editor. And so uh, I found out from my staff, because I didn't read who had written the letter to the editor, it was in fact John Smith who wrote the letter to the editor. <laughs> and so in that, uh, in, that letter, in that letter, though, John, uh, John wondered if Harry and those who gave uh, their all would find us to be good stewards of his father's legacy. And he wrote, have we done them justice? Would they feel their lives have created a greater good? So John's resolve and the critical questions he continues to ask are proof that Harry's legacy, in fact, lives on. They're also a challenge to which, to which we, may, we must all rise. Because when the world seemed to be at its darkest, Harry and millions of women and men like him came together and beat back the scourge of fascism. But they didn't stop there. They took the fight to their communities, their streets, and their voting booths. They built a movement. They built the communities and the systems they wanted. They secured more justice, equity, and opportunity, gains that we all still benefit from today. The blueprint is the same now as it was then. I think what Harry was telling us through his writing, his work, and his prolific tweets was pretty clear. We changed the world for the better. Now it's your turn. We all miss him, his example, his wit, his wisdom, his tweets. And we'll do what he asked. We will stand together with our heads held high and our hearts strong here and around the globe. We will organize and we'll fight for that green and pleasant land that Harry envisioned. I look forward to fighting with all of you to make sure that it's realized. Thank you very, very much, Harry. Merci beaucoup, miigwech. So, I find it funny that I'm standing up here because normally I should be standing down there or sitting down there with you while my dad's talking up here and then seeing him at the end and saying you did good and he goes yeah you think that's bloody easy don't you <laughs> but good evening before I start I'd like to thank the Broadbent Institute the IAFF all the speakers that have come to celebrate my dad's life and you and the audience for your loyalty and love to him during his last stand to not make his past our future what a life my dad had, born into poverty, denied a proper education, starved and abused by unmitigated capitalism, warrior against Hitler's fascism, soldier and occupier of a broken Germany in 1945, lover, friend and husband to Frida, new immigrant, manual laborer, night school student, father, fixer of GI Joes, oriental carpet expert, late night dancer, protester to free trade, apartheid, and all that didn't sit right with him, retiree, caregiver, advocate for the mentally ill, gardener, shoulder to lean on, wise man, author, public speaker, pain in the ass to the mighty, D 
dear friend, comrade in the world's oldest rebel. What a life it was. And my dad played it with so much passion, love, empathy, desire, humor, and gentleness for 95 years. All of us are only granted a brief dance to the music of time. But my dad took those moments of existence and made the matter for not only himself, but those he loved and those who believed in social justice. Few of us will live as long as he did or see and experience as much as he did. Think of it. He was born in 1923, just 20 years after the first motorized airplane flight at Kitty Hawk. And he died almost 100 years later in a world changed by technology, but still plagued by the greed of the entitled. In each season of his life, he was vibrant and determined to grow as an individual. Even in the cold blaze of old age when death stalked him and he felt his body wither like a garden in winter. My dad did not shrink from living and loving. But where do I begin in the telling of this story about this remarkable, unique, beautiful creature that was my father? I am the last person in his life to truly know him and love him because his wife, my mother, and my brother Peter predeceased him. His friends from his youth are dead. His brothers and sisters are dead. His friends from his middle age are dead. All those that shaped his life but me are dead. My dad said that living into your 90s was like being a rare beast forever separated from its species, caged in a zoo, adored by strangers that don't speak your language. So it is left to me to conjure out of words who Harry Leslie Smith was as a boy, a teenager, a young recruit in the RAF, a suitor to my mother, a father, a caregiver to his wife, and my brother, and my best friend for the last 10 years of his life. At night now, when I close my eyes, I think back to the early years of my childhood. I can hear the wind that once rustled through a row of poplar trees that stood in the schoolyard at the back of my family's suburban house in Scarborough. I can see my family when they were young and all of our lives stood before us with the surety of happiness like daybreak at a cottage in summer. I can feel the contentment of bedtime when I was six and knew that before sleeping my dad would entertain me with a story. But one evening I grew tired of Peter Rabbit and asked my dad to tell me another story. Do you want to hear about Christopher Robin and Pooh Bear, he asked. No, I said, I want to hear the story about you, I replied. And so in a series of bedtime stories, I learned that the happy life my family led wasn't the way of the world. Like a master tailor, my dad threaded his early life into the fabric of my soul and tied it tightly with the bonds of love, loyalty, and family. In the comfort of my childhood bed, my dad revealed to me all the unhappiness of his early youth. He told me about his life growing up in a series of slums in the north of England. He spoke of his eldest sister Marion's battle with TB, her confinement and death at the age of 10 in a workhouse infirmary. He told me about how she was dumped into a pauper's pit and how at the age of seven, he was put to work as a beer barrow boy and forced to forage through the garbage bins to keep from starving. Each tale of suffering told was countered by another story that revealed that my dad had many moments of great happiness, love and laughter during his harsh childhood. Still, no matter the scars, both physical and emotional, that my dad gained as a bairn swathed in poverty, he ensured that his children would not know the sorrows of hunger, homelessness, and lives thwarted by lack of opportunity. We were showered with love, affection, and encouragement to follow our dreams and be decent human beings. My dad had a quiet and gentle nobility that not even the horrors of the Second World War could tarnish. In fact, his capacity for empathy for the vulnerable didn't diminish, but grew while he served in the RAF during the 20th century's bloodiest of wars. His encounters with refugees in 1945 and newly liberated Holland and Germany left a strong watermark of compassion on his soul. But it was in Hamburg where my dad was stationed as part of the post-war occupational forces that his life was transformed by a chance encounter at a ramshackle black market with a young German woman who he fell in love with at first sight. The young German woman, however, was no slave to sentimentality and understood the words of Tommy soldiers were cheap and dangerous. But over time, in a city ravaged by war, teeming with despair and loneliness, they became lovers and then friends and then husband and wife. Even to this day, it astounds me that my mother trusted my father so much that she agreed to leave her native country and settle in Britain, because that is an enormous ask, considering that in 1948, the world wasn't interconnected, and to communicate between nearby cities or distant countries, letters were written. Those early years weren't easy times for my mom or my dad, and their marriage almost fell apart in England. 
It got so bad between them that my mother even left my father and returned to Germany, feeling that her love affair with my dad had run its course. But somehow, love prevailed. But it only survived because my mother suggested that neither of them could prosper in Britain, and so should emigrate to Canada. So at the age of 30, my dad, along with my mom, embarked on the greatest odyssey of their lives by becoming immigrants and traveling to a new and faraway land. It was here in Canada that my parents put down roots, were able, were able because of the welfare state, to purchase a home, bring children into the world, put food on the table, and create a household that was both loving and nurturing. For my dad, the late 1960s, 1970s, and 80s were paradise for him, because all of us were healthy and the future was filled with optimistic prospects. For 35 years, life was good to my father, but when he retired, the storms of illness and death began to gather around him and our family. The good times were coming to a rapid and horrible end. First, rheumatoid arthritis struck my mother with an unrelenting cruelty that left her disabled, diminished, and struggling to maintain her independence, especially because my parents lacked private insurance to pay for her medicine. Yet as my mom grew more ill, my dad didn't despair because his youth in the slums of Yorkshire had taught him that life is a brief affair that must begin and end in love to endure it. So he took care of her and built her a beautiful garden in their retirement home on Rice Lake. He kept my mother going through singing songs to her, telling jokes, and trying to make the best of a bad situation. And just when my parents thought they were getting a handle on my mother's illness, my brother Peter became gravely ill with schizophrenia. He was uh, in a desperate state because of his mental illness, and without my parents' gentle love for him and insistence that he come live with them, he would not have survived his disease. But these were dark days for my parents because mental illness is not kind or quiet or gentle, and it was a struggle to keep Pete on his medication because they had such a devastating effect on his body and soul. My dad wouldn't give up on my brother, and he kept him safe during those years when his mental illness was at its most extreme. My dad was the one who coaxed my brother to return to his vocation as an artist. My dad was the one that slept with Peter when it was feared he would do harm to himself. It was my dad that took him to a pub every week so he could feel part of humanity. It was my dad that kept the ship afloat when all around him had given up hope. My dad never surrendered. One inch of love, compassion, humor, and decency when it came to taking care of both my brother and my mother. And so time passed, and my brother Peter stabilized and was able to join with small steps the outside world. In May of 1999, Peter was well enough to marry the love of his life, Maria. But in July of 1999, my mom died quickly from cancer at the age of 70. Upon her death, the grief was intolerable for him, the sorrow so enormous that I feared for his survival. But as I was to learn in my dad's journals, it was Peter that kept him alive for those first few months after my mom died. You see, Peter still lived at home, and they kept each other company during those long nights of grief. And that should have been the end of, this, of his story. It should have ended with my brother getting older, me getting older, and my dad gently aging until death took him. But the natural order of, it, of events didn't happen for us because tragedy is the price we pay for being alive and there are no sure bets in life. We didn't ask for it, we didn't expect it, but in 2009, at the age of 50, my charming, brilliant brother died at the age of 50 horribly from pulmonary fibrosis. For both my dad and me, the clocks in our lives stopped the moment Pete died. The grief pitch black the, the grief was pitch black, and we couldn't see our way out of it. We fled to Portugal. But there, all we heard in the roar of the tide against the beach near our rented home was our sadness over the death of a son and brother. My dad was not going to survive Pete's death, and so I remembered what my mom said to me a few days before she died. I am glad that I was able to give your father the love he needed to survive. I realized if I wanted to help my dad survive this grief and not see his days end in anger and sorrow and in defeat, I had to give all my love to him so that he could walk free from the chains of mourning that had shackled him since the death of my mom. That is how Harry's last stand was born. It was born in the sorrow and despair of Pete's death to give my dad purpose and relevance 
The last 10 years of my dad's life were hard, beautiful years. And because we were alone, we became more than father and son. We became partners, friends, and comrades. Our relationship, because of the, of the work we did, the books that he had written, the speaking tours we embarked on in Canada and Britain, because it became as strong as a good marriage. Over these years, we relied upon each other so much and trusted each other so much that I know that we both became better people because of our intense love for each other. When I was a boy, my dad told me about a recurring dream he had when he was young and lived with his family in a cramped, rotting Doss house that was overpopulated with other families made homeless by the, by the Great Depression. There he slept in an unheated attic with his dad on a mattress, rife with bugs and a coat from St. Vincent de Paul as a blanket. And when he fell asleep, he dreamed that he was a hawk flying high above the city of Bradford. At first, the dream was joyous and liberating, as he thought he had escaped his poverty below. But then as he tried to climb higher into the sky, he felt himself being tugged back down to the ground and saw that his claw had a chain locked around it that was fastened to the chimney pot on the roof of the DOS. When his breath stopped and his nurse put a stethoscope to his chest and said in a quiet tone to me, he's gone, I said, now you are free to soar far away from here. Not like a hawk, but like the lark ascending into the gentleness of a blue sky. What a life, what a legacy, what a responsibility for us that are left alive to continue to persevere with what he and so many others from his generation did to build a better Canada. Because if we don't, my dad's past will most definitely become our future. Thank you so much. Bonjour, Ansley, Indigenous Cause, Toronto, Dudu, Chabal. My name is Ansley Simpson. I'm Mechisogic Nishnalbek from, um, well, we were from the mouths of the river. Um, it's an absolute honor to be here tonight to sing for Harry and his family and to help encourage everyone in this room, including myself, to continue this legacy and to become the rebels ourselves. When I was thinking about what to, to sing tonight, um, this first song came to mind. It's not one that I do live very often, um, but I felt it was fitting, and it's called Sleeping Giant. Sleeping Giant, I won't wake you. Walking through your bed Will the winter let her guard down Streams wait to be fed Blanket me with furs you trap a time that you went deep Took everything you owned And laid it down like offerings Scarcity is more than plenty It's more than we both know I won't be there when you wake up I will let you go tobacco near the skin behind your ear where rivers waters war you bear 
with gentle touch for years. Sleeping giant, I won't wake you walking through your bed. Will the winter wait to be fed. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to play one more. Um, this next song is a song that's about dissolving back into the earth as medicine after living a good life. Um, and I feel like Harry is going to make some really strong medicine in a really good way. If I said Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, tonight I'm here uh, representing uh, the International Association of Firefighters and we, we proudly represent uh, about 27,000 
uh, men and women that uh, make up the fire service across Canada in our major cities, and we also represent uh, over 300,000 across North America. Uh, we were given the opportunity back in 2015 to be part of Harry's Last Stand tour across Canada, and we were, we were very happy when at a conference we held in Calgary in 2015, we were able to pair our conference with Harry's, uh, with Harry's event there. And that was the first opportunity I had to meet Harry, and a lot of our, our members that attended the conference had to meet Harry. And, and what we immediately understood was what we shared with Harry. And I think so much of it's been talked about tonight, but Harry's sense of duty when Harry joined the army and went to war, it was a sense of duty to humanity. It was a sense of, of duty that was beyond borders. It wasn't about borders. It was about fighting for humanity, about fighting for the right cause, about looking after each other. Harry's legacy of his life was one of perseverance, of never giving up, of uh, fighting those things you believe in right, uh, right till the end. And I can't think of two qualities that, that resonate uh, as well in, my, in our profession as well. Uh, it's something, when the alarm bells sound, we don't think about where we're going or who we're going to. We only think about what we can offer. And that was, I think, Kerry's other key message is that what he understood is that healthcare, education, Emergency services are not expenses, they are not a cost to society, they are an investment in society. And if we fail to see them as investments in something that creates uh, equality and creates a healthier society for all of us, we are destined to go back. And that was part of Harry's main message, certainly to me, when we stood beside him in Calgary we stood beside a hero, and when we stand beside each other, we need to look at our, our doctors, our teachers, our laborers, our home builders, our firefighters, our nurses as heroes as well. And uh, with that, I just want to say it's, it's been so proud, so proud to share the legacy of, of Harry's uh, heroics throughout the years and be part of this.